Evoking the name Merlin, I think, is quite appropriate for our next guest. Um, he has a kind of uh, wizard-like quality to him, in my experience, and uh, Dr. Michael Claridge, uh, PhD from Brandeis with studying uh, biological and statistical behavior of proteins, uh, has uh, certainly ex examined and explored a lot of fascinating fields of inquiry. And, but uh, what I think is cool is that he spent years traveling the country with his brother, lecturing on fractional calculus, fractals, and chaotic systems. I think that would really make a great road movie. So maybe, maybe Doug, you can get the guys in Hollywood to pick up a, a screenplay on that. I think it could be a really interesting movie. Uh, but uh, right now, Dr. Claridge is one of our lead scientists for the Sapphire Project. So you've already been introduced to him. If you didn't know him, you watched him tinkering with all those great toys in the Sapphire demonstration yesterday. I thought that looked like so much fun and so cool. And it reminded me uh, that uh, the actual practice of science is an art. It's about problem solving, putting together the equipment one needs in order to examine the, the, the problem one wants to study, and that it really does require the, uh, the, the sense of uh, creative problem solving that would be found in any of the art forms. Uh, but the, th the thing that's really cool about Dr. Claridge is his taste in ties. <laughs> so please welcome to the stage the man who can, Dr. Michael Claridge. Very happy to be here. We've already heard from Monty Childs about the design of the Sapphire experiment. And I will not review the many ways in which the fusion model of the sun is lacking and the ways that the electric models of the sun might do a better job. My hope in this talk is to convey two ways that the Sapphire experiment will be correlating its measurements to how we measure the sun. I have never much fought about or derided other scientists' theories. I have worked with some of the best and the brightest. I was on the team at the Arecibo Radio Telescope working on how to show that the behavior of binary pulsars agrees very well with Einstein's field equations of general relativity. The existing models of the sun actually describe some things very well. There's a lot of talk at these conferences about the solar wind and how the current models do not explain the behavior of the solar wind. But did you know that the third generation kinetic models that simultaneously solve the Fulker-Planck equations for both electrons and protons claim to predict the speed of the solar wind to within 98% accuracy out to the orbit of Jupiter? That's pretty good for any theory. So why are we looking for new models? We're looking for new models because the ones we have used up to now have completely ignored the role of electricity in the solar system. And yet more and more, everywhere we look, we're seeing more examples of electricity and electric currents in the solar system. So if we're finding that electric fields and currents are all around us, then we should adjust our models to include that fact. It's really that simple. The SAFFIRE experiment is being designed to help us to learn more about the role of electricity in the solar system. We probably will be surprised by what we learn. I am not wedded to any one particular theory about the sun. I am pretty open about the whole topic. And that is one of the points of the SAFFIRE experiment, to be open about different models of the sun. This is one of the most confusing diagrams that we have about the sun. It is a graph of the temperature of the sun's atmosphere as a function of how far away we are from the sun's surface. Close in, this is at the photosphere, that's the part of the sun we see with our eyes, the temperature is at about 6,000 degrees. On Earth, we do not find anything at 6,000 degrees. Ultra-high-end industrial furnaces might reach 3,000, maybe 4,000 degrees to melt tungsten. So basically, the photosphere of the sun is hotter than anything that we can imagine. And if we were to send anything from this Earth up to the photosphere, it would vaporize. Now, according to this graph, as you move away from the surface of the sun, at first the temperature decreases slightly, then it rises a little, and then at a certain point, not very far away, it shoots way up into millions of degrees. Now, how do we know this? 
How did we come to the point of being able to claim that we know that this is the temperature at these distances from the sun? We have not sent astronauts to the sun with thermometers. So there must be some other way that we claim to know this. We make these statements about the temperature of the sun because we are very skillful at measuring light. We've all seen the prism which splits sunlight into a rainbow. And this is a very carefully measured rainbow of the light of the sun as seen here on Earth. The colors in the middle are the colors that we see with our eyes. And the height of the graph, how high up the color is, represents how much energy we see at that wavelength. And you can see that we actually receive more blue light from the sun than red light. Now the darker regions on either side are wavelengths of light that we cannot see with our eyes, but they're coming at us nonetheless. Over here are the high energy ultraviolet wavelengths, over here are the wavelengths of heat. When we draw these spectra, we don't usually put in the colors. It's much easier just to draw lines to represent the intensity. So we can redraw the graph of the sun spectra simply with a line as a function of wavelength. Wavelengths on the horizontal axis here. Now candlelight put through a prism has its own characteristic spectrum, very different from sunlight. The candlelight spectrum looks like that. And a neon light from a neon light sign sent through a spectrum has a very different kind of spectrum, lots of sharp lines. Now since Sir Isaac Newton began quantifying the wavelengths of light in the rainbow, scientists have put in thousands of man years into studying every substance on Earth. And we have been keeping records and building theories about all this, and it's brought us to the point where if you were to show a spectroscopy expert a spectrum from some unknown substance, he or she would probably be able to tell you in a couple of days exactly what was that substance and how you got that spectrum. Did you burn your sample? Did you put an electric current through it? The science of light is very well advanced. Now in the early 20th century, scientists were exploring the atomic theory of matter. You and I take for granted this theory of matter, that all matter is made of atoms. But if we were born 200 years ago, we would not think about the world in such terms. Richard Feynman, one of the fathers of modern physics, stated that the atomic theory of matter was the most successful scientific theory of all time. And in the early 20th century, the atomic theory was a new idea, and experimenters were exploring its validity, and scientists were burning and electrocuting and exploding everything they could get their hands on, and sometimes they were taking measurements, too. <laughs> and these gases of individual Elements, neon, argon, hydrogen, they're very useful to study because they have these narrow lines. And we found that if we vary the temperature of the neon light, then the bulb, sorry, the neon bulb, then the details of the peaks will change. This is what a neon light spectrum looks like at a low temperature. At a high temperature, the peaks all spread out. So we study how the width varies as a function of temperature. And we find that matter is very predictable in this regard. If you show me a spectrum from a neon bulb, I can look at how spread out the lines are and tell you very accurately what temperature your neon bulb was at. So we take all this knowledge that we have gathered here on Earth and we look up at the sun and we apply the same ideas to the light that we are receiving from the sun. So let's imagine that we're going to take just one of these lines, just going to look at one line. And it does not need to be from neon, it can be from anything. And we look at this one element and we study how the width of that one line changes as we move away from the sun. Let me repeat that. We're going to take one spectral line and we're going to study how the width of that line changes as we look farther and farther away from the sun. We know how to relate the line width to temperature, and so that should allow us to, to say what is the temperature as we move away from the sun. Now imagine that we looked at the emission lines from the surface of the sun, and that the widths of the lines got narrower and narrower as we moved away. According to our theory, that would mean that the temperature of the gas was getting cooler and cooler as you moved away from the sun. Now imagine we'd seen something like this where the width of the lines stayed the same 
as we moved away from the sun. Then we would say that the temperature as you move away from the sun stays the same. But what astronomers found, and we're very surprised by, is that at first the line widths get very narrow, then they start to broaden, and they very quickly become so broad that it must correspond to several millions of degrees. This is one way that astrophysicists have concluded the temperature of the solar corona as we move away from the sun. Now those of you in the audience familiar with more of the details of these theories and measurements might be cringing a little bit now as I have apparently grossly oversimplified both the experiments and the theories. But if you consider, I think the basic idea I am conveying does apply to the more scientifically accurate descriptions of the measurements and the theories. Now in the SAPPHIRE experiment, we seek to duplicate such measurements made of the sun. We will look at emission line widths at different locations in the chamber, and we will apply the same theories about matter to determine the temperature of our chamber in different locations. Now we may find that our measurements exactly duplicate the strangeness of the sun. We may find not at all. If we already knew what we would find, it wouldn't be an experiment. Now I'd like to introduce you to a second aspect of why we are doing the SAPPHIRE experiment. We are actually looking to redefine some basic ideas in physics, or at least opening up the discussion among scientists about what certain physical ideas might mean. We've talked about temperature, but temperature is actually a tricky notion to a physicist. We have a simple sense-based understanding of temperature. The ice cube is cold, the exhaust pipe is hot. Everything that we handle in this wet, cool world on the surface of our Earth has a temperature. But does the earthly concept of temperature really apply directly to what is happening on the sun? Some of us here think maybe not. And we're not simply being contrary. We actually have good reason for thinking this way. See, our current scientific ideas about temperature were formulated in the late 1800s using steam and hot metal. This is the science of thermodynamics. Our current scientific ideas about temperature were not formulated using electricity. So the old saying, if, everything, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, it is possible that our ideas of thermodynamics are not really the best suited ones for every situation. Imagine that we are looking at some astronomical body far, far away. And we have our advanced abilities to measure light. And we see evidence in the light that water is being broken up into oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, so we're, we're seeing the light evidence of that. One scientist would say, well, that is proof that on the surface of that object far, far away is about 2,000 degrees. Because if I put water into a furnace here on Earth and go up to 2,000 degrees, the water will dissociate into hydrogen and oxygen. But another scientist might say, no, the dissociation of water into hydrogen and oxygen in that body is actually proof that there's a 9-volt electrical potential on that astronomical body. Because if I drop a 9-volt battery into a glass of water, that will break apart the water into oxygen and hydrogen. We can do that experiment on Earth. So which theory would be right? about this hypothetical body far, far away. Is its surface a 2,000 degree oven? Or is there a 9 volt potential on the surface? Now, since astronomers have historically ignored the role of electricity on the sun, they've tried to explain everything we see in terms of temperature, like a furnace. But if you include electricity in the description, that has the potential to change everything about how we describe the sun. Looking back at this problematic diagram about the sun, Recall that this line is what we say is the temperature of the sun as we move away from the sun. That temperature listed is the temperature a furnace would have to be in order to produce what we see in the light coming from the sun. But maybe the spectra would appear the same way if the sun were simply at a several hundred volt difference from its surroundings. And then we could redraw this diagram as a function of voltage as we move away from the sun. And maybe we would find that it looks like some of the voltage diagrams that people here, such as Don Scott, have drawn. Or maybe we'll find something very different. 
We're still working out some of the ways to prove this in the Sapphire experiment, but we have some very good ideas. There's a lot going on in the Sapphire experiment I have not talked about. But I think if you can understand the two ideas I did present, you'll have a pretty good idea about what we are doing and why. I'll end by thanking all of you here today. Thank the other members of the Sapphire team for their hard work and their stout hearts. And thanking our benefactors, without whom none of this would be possible. Thank you. <laughs>